Good morning. This is the Eager Beaver Show. You are listening to a True North Eager Beaver Media Incorporated podcast. The True North Eager Beaver podcasts are proudly brought to you by our founding sponsors. The Misfee Mysteries from Corvid Moon Publishing, your source for science fiction, fantasy, and cozy mysteries featuring a broad diversity of characters. CanadianTarot.com, your uniquely Canadian online eclectic tarot community. And The Pepper Master, hot pepper sauces made from farm-fresh ingredients to thrill your taste buds and expand your mind. Well, good morning and hello, kids, and welcome to season three and episode number 352 of the Daily Beaver Morning Show here on the Cryer Media Network. Yeah, a little smooth, yeah, for you this morning. I'm your host, the eager beaver pronouns he, him, hey, Mr. Beaver A, and with me as always is my good friend, Mr. Grizzly. It's so nice to see you here, kids. Thank you for joining us. As usual, we say thank you to our podcast founding sponsors, The Pepper Master, The Misfee Mysteries from Corvin Moon Publishing, and CanadianTarot.com. As you can see, Mr. Grizzly is here with me today, so let's ask him, how's your mental health doing this morning, sir? Well, uh, my dog woke me up promptly at five, crawled into bed beside me and panted, which meant she's anxious, which means she needs out. So 5.15, I was getting dressed. I took her outside. She really needed out. <laughs> Ooh, okay. Didn't even make it to the grass. Gotcha. Right on the street. Three times. Okay. <laughs> so let's say I've had a rather shitty start to the day. Ah, uh, but I'm t- <laughs> human. It's ne- it's go time, like yeah. now. <laughs> yeah. Oh, and I knew, I knew, I knew. Like, okay, she's she's never anxious like this in the morning, never. So I was like, mm-hmm. yeah, we we got to go. So I took her out, and we had a little walk and played fetch in the park. And uh, there's no other dogs out at that hour, so. You know, mm-hmm. 30, 30, almost 45 minutes in the park. So oh, good nice. start to the day. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Puppy time is always good time. Mm-hmm. That's what I say. All right, kids and cubs. Uh, we have a bit of a show for you today. Uh, there's a lot of stuff going on. Um, eventful stuff, too. Um, the big news is actually not um, so much local or national at the moment, uh, but international. It seems that uh, in the, the Israel-Gaza region, there was uh, an incident where um, foreign aid workers from World Central Kitchen mm-hmm. uh, met with uh, a rather sudden end. Uh, <laughs> World Central Kitchen, sorry? I, I was going to say, I read, I read that... Um, there's something fishy about the whole thing. I don't know if you know about this. So what happened was they they told the IDF where they were going to be, right? So it's like, don't bomb us. We're going to be here feeding people. It's like, yeah, no problem. Yep. So they bombed them. Yep. So then another truck came in to rescue them. And as they were rescuing them, they got bombed. Yep. And then a third truck rescued those folks and they got bombed. Hmm. So it's kind of a fishy little story. Yeah. I'm 
the details I have are, are are not that precise specifically, and maybe a little contradictory. Um, yeah, yeah, it's it's sketchy, right? Yeah, it's sketchy. Um, but it, it's caused the World Central Kitchen to suspend operations and close a sea route that it was using to feed hundreds of thousands of hungry people in northern Gaza. So far, the World Central Kitchen has distributed over 42 million meals. Okay. Other private or aid organizations have also halted operations as a result of the incident. Uh, the incident is uh, the way that uh, I got it from the news. And like I said, this is these are all preliminary, mm-hmm. uh, so things might change. Uh, was that there was a three-car convoy mm-hmm. involved. Uh, so not so much that one car came to, to save another one, but that there was an actual <clears> three-car <throat> convoy happening. Uh, and uh, returning from an aid delivery uh, mission, and uh, which in uh, a zone that was supposedly deconflicted, right. when a drone flying overhead opened fire, launching three missiles a few minutes apart at each car. When they hit, hit the first car, people survived that one and scrambled out of it and got into a second vehicle, right. which was hit, and then the third one was hit as well. Uh, seven people in all were killed. One Australian woman, a Polish man, three British citizens, all of them former servicemen, including two former Royal Marines. One Canadian American dual citizen, a 33 year old person named Jacob Flickinger, uh, Flickinger, Flickinger, and uh, their Palestinian driver. This has caused a huge international incident with Canada, the United States, Poland, Australia. Um, and uh, the, the UK demanding an investigation and causing even a former national security advisor and, permanent, and the permanent secretary of the UK's foreign office to say, sometimes in conflict, you get a moment when there's such global outrage that it crystallizes a sense that things can't go on like this and called for the UK to stop supplying weapons to Israel. This is the second time now that we've heard this. The first time we heard this was US Senator Chuck Schumer mm-hmm. speech. He said that uh, maybe not uh, in his case, he didn't go to stop supplying weapons to Israel, but he was saying stop supplying offensive weapons while still being willing to supply defensive weapons. And Chuck Schumer is the one I I think I mentioned in a show, I think last week, that it was uh, Vice President Kamala Harris. And that was a mistake on my part. It was Mm -hmm. Senator Chuck Schumer that mentioned in that speech that uh, the U.S. withholding its veto that the UN Security Council could be an right. potential consequence, and turns out that the US has already delivered that consequence before anything, mm. something like this happened. Um, and uh, when we reported, uh, we reported that we reported that uh, Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu had then canceled a delegation that was set to go to the Washington to discuss what Israel's plans were to, uh, um, I guess, clear. Uh, the city of Rafa of Hamas, and uh, Netanyahu had canceled that, which uh, only made the Americans think, well, this just confirms that we took the right position. So Netanyahu then rescheduled that <laughs> pretty quickly uh, via video uh, to have that discussion with the, the United States. So it seems that uh, Netanyahu is a little rattled. It also doesn't help that there have been major protests all over the past few days, uh, tens of thousands of people. In Israel. In Israel. Yes. Um, are protesting uh, for many reasons. Some were protesting him before, some are protesting this war, but a lot of them mm-hmm. are now upset, saying, you know, you've been at this for a while now and uh, you've not released any hostages. So yeah. uh, Enough. what's this doing for us? Yeah. Um, it's just more bloodshed on both sides. And unfortunately, like uh, we've said from the beginning, it's all the innocents that are getting harmed in the process. And and this targeting the World Central Kitchen, and it was targeted. I'm sorry, laser-guided missiles from a drone, that's targeted. That was not an accident. That makes you wonder if they're just trying to, you know, how they said, we'll starve them out. Which one of their ministers said that? We'll starve them out? Mm-hmm. Well, when you stop people... F- food aid, food. Aid. Oh, sorry, I'm. Yep, I know, I know. Israeli President Benjamin Netanyahu said that the aid convoy was attacked in error, that the deaths were unintentional, that an independent body will be established to conduct a full investigation. Had yeah. these types of situations not happened many times before, I'd probably be more inclined to believe this. But it's uh, in a partridge in a pear tree, we've heard this yeah. song before. Considering that, I mean, we've seen this you know, specifically with journalists. Yes. Have had like the big thing press, and then all of a sudden, you know, one journalist is there, and they get taken out. And it's amazing how often that they're journalists from Al Jazeera. Yeah. Mm. Yes. So, um, 
this oh way, sorry this was an error we did not miss we, how we didn't know or we thought that the the, the the you know that they had weapons or we thought that they they were from this part like this one they have the big thin vest with press written on it and so in this case uh they're saying it's um anyway he says this was a tragic case of our forces unintentionally hitting innocent people in the gaza strip this happens in wartime which seems like a rather flippant response. Mm -hmm. And it confirms many people's impression that for Israel, collateral damage is more than acceptable in reaching uh, the goal. And this confirms something that uh, we reported on in the very, very few first few days of the Israel response, uh, when I don't think it was Netanyahu itself, but it may have been his chief of uh, defense in that case uh, that basically said, uh, when they were talking, uh, when other nations were talking about uh, efforts to get foreign nationals out of Gaza, and Israel wasn't allowing that to happen, mm -hmm. uh, I was just saying um, our priority is uh, ridding Gaza of Hamas and all other considerations. All are secondary. So, in other words, uh, if you've got people there and they happen to be collateral damage, well, too bad, so sad. Uh, which seems to be rather flippant, and it seems this attitude uh, months later is still the prevailing attitude within uh, the government of Israel at the moment. Israel's military chief said that the strike was a mistake that followed a misidentification, which is a rather interesting claim given that at least one of the cars actually has a hole right where the world central food kitchen yeah. or the world food kitchen logo was on the roof. in the car and given that uh well given that drones have the ability to strike with such precision i'm gonna guess that they are equipped with sort of cameras in some kind or that allow to see very clearly what it is that is about to be hit and i'm pretty sure that since for example radar sat 2 which is way up in space mm -hmm. can take pictures so clear that if you are on the ground smoking a cigarette it can read the brand of the cigarette written on the cigarette yeah. i'm guessing drone technology was pretty much able to convey an image that said world central world kitchen or so i would keep on they thinking. knew what they were doing world central kitchen sorry uh pretty clearly for people to see i'm speculating here i have no military knowledge whatsoever to give you an impression but i would assume the technology is advanced enough that if you're going to you know be issuing a drone strike i'm sure that there's several thousands of dollars involved with building a drone and putting a missile on it and deploying it that you would have something that would allow you to target very clearly what it is see the what drone you're pilots are well-trained individuals they don't make big mistakes like that Yes, but also I'm turned, you know, said, oh, well, the, the image was fuzzy or some bullshit. Or that's a 4K have a camera. camera. That, that's what I'm saying. I would suspect that if you're putting all that money in that system, that you would also put something that allows you to very clearly see what it is that you're aiming at. They, they have I would assume. gigantic monitors in front of them, 4K. They want to be able to very clearly see their target so that they can identify it before they eliminate it. This was not an accident. This was targeted. They'll tell you, oh, you know, sometimes these things happen in wartime. Yeah, bullshit. It was targeted. Yeah. So, but basically, it's, yeah, the, this, uh, this is war and, you know, things happen. Now, to give you uh, an idea, again, I'm not, I do not know enough to know that this is the type of vehicle specifically that was being used here. But, uh, Mr. Grizzly, if you will show it. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not like the world central kitchen is discreet with its logo. No, no. Well, have you seen the, uh, the picture of the vehicle with the hole in the roof? Uh, not specifically as I was okay. looking for this one, I, I saw it, but yes, yeah, I did. I did see it and, uh, it's more of an SUV uh, yeah. the vehicle they were in, but it does have a giant logo on the roof of the vehicle. It's not on the discreet. roof itself. Okay. Yes. See, in this case, they put it on the roof so it could be seen from the air in, exactly. in this area. So this is an organization that clearly has a lot of experience doing with this, doing this type of thing, and therefore said, hey, you know what? The logos on the side of the vehicle may not be enough in this case if something can hit us from above. So let's put the logo on top. Exactly. So, but apparently unintentional and a mistake. 
according to Israel, if they are to be believed. The Prime Minister of Canada calls the event heartbreaking and absolutely unacceptable. Quote, we obviously need full accountability and investigation in this. There needs to be clarity on how this happened, and we need to make sure. We are pushing continually towards the ceasefire so more aid workers are not in danger as they try to respond to the suffering on the ground in Gaza. Um, President Biden said the death of the seven eight workers are tragic and that it was not a standalone incident. I'll repeat, the United States said, um, this is tragic and this is not a standalone incident. In other words, you guys have done this before and we weren't impressed then. While these are the first international foreign aid workers to be killed since the start of the conflict, the United Nations Secretary General Antonio Guterres said that 196 aid workers so far have been killed. As well as many people trying to access aid. Mm -hmm. So over 190, about 196 foreign aid workers have been killed so far. In a statement, he said, uh, President Biden said that Israel is not doing enough to protect civilians, saying the war in Gaza has been the worst in recent memory in terms of the number of aid workers who have been killed, as substantiated by the UN Secretary General. The White House, uh, it is the word on the tweet is that the White House is angry and beyond belief, and the president will make this very clear to Israel that humanitarian workers need to be protected. The White House National Security Spokesperson John Kirby condemned the killings. Uh, but said that the attack will not stop military aid to Israel. Uh, that's what they're saying publicly. This here, here's <clears throat> here. I've got I've got something for you. I'll put this on the screen from uh, Mohammed Safa. Uh, Mohammed mm -hmm. Safa, for those yeah. of you who don't know, is is um, uh, with the UN ECOSOC accredited UN uh, Nations Geneva office. Okay. So, the attack on World Central Kitchen aid workers in Gaza is not an isolated incident. World Central Kitchen had informed Israel of their movement. Then Israel decided to make three targeted strikes. Not one, but the first and last. World Central Kitchen vehicle being over 2.4 kilometers apart, killing seven World Central Kitchen humanitarian workers. So, there's truck one, there's truck two, and you can see in that image, yep. that there's the hole through the roof, and you can see the yep. World Central Kitchen logo on the roof. Yep. What there you go. It, right? Yep. So okay. you can't tell me that wasn't targeted. Yep. So, but th that that input that information is important because see, when somebody tells tells to me a convoy of three cars, mm -hmm. I guess I think, think that they're, they're actually three in a, three yeah. in a row. Though they had a certain uh, amount, so that's why it could seem that they 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 shot one and then they waited a while and shot the other one. So, actually, both accounts are true because the convoy was not, uh, uh, you know, like when you think of elephants, trunk holding tail, mm -hmm. <laughs> yes. you know. It wasn't, it wasn't like that. Okay, interesting. Well, here's uh, another one for you, too. This is where it gets, this is where the plot thickens, if you will. This is from Chris Hayes from MSNBC. Mm -hmm. Somehow it missed this. this. This strike is not the first incident in which World Central Kitchen staff were wounded in Gaza. On Saturday, an IDF sniper fired at a car headed to a food warehouse in the Khan Yunus area. He hit the car's windshield, but the volunteer inside was unharmed. The World Central Kitchen immediately filed a complaint with the IDF after the incident and demanded the Army stop the fire towards its staff and guarantee their safety when distributing food in the Gaza Strip, which is carried out with full coordination. The IDF did not comment on the organization's inquiry about that incident. Mm -hmm. So all of this has led uh, Mayor of Zanzin, who is an analyst with the International Crisis Group, to say, quote, Israel's creating not only a breakdown of order and a vacuum, but the people who try to fill it are also being targeted. It's very hard not to see this as some kind of strategy of using aid as a weapon. Yeah. The other day we were talking about accusations uh, made against Israel of using starvation as a weapon of war. Uh, yeah. That's what they're doing. And these types of uh, stories where we're hearing from... Uh, this organization that uh, this is not the first time and that it's happening uh, again and despite complaints would uh, only lead again let's put it this way if you're one of the people sitting on the sideline going you know isn't this a little much and um, yeah you know uh, have you guys actually decided that foreign aid workers are acceptable collateral damage
Well, it certainly seems like it. Because I, I don't know what the other threats in the area were. And they're saying that this was like misidentified. Yeah, you can really see the logo now. It's on the roof. It takes on up the roof. It takes up a, a third of the roof, maybe a, a quarter of yeah. the roof. Of the and even on the even even on the front on the windshield. windshield. And so this place, this thing is like identified, like clearly identified. We couldn't see the logo. Bullshit. It's a 4K camera on drones. You are you've give, you're given all the uh, tools in the world to clearly identify your target. Yeah. This was and a if, targeted strike. And if they're saying that this was misidentified and the, the three cars in the convoy were kilometers apart and one is hit and then the other and then the next and there were only three missiles fired and only three vehicles hit and all three of them happened to be World... It's, I, gee, I misidentified that World Central Kitchen vehicle. The first... Oh, there's a second one that's that logo didn't identify... Yeah, yeah. And yeah. I, I misidentified that one. Oh, and it's... Uh, I guess, and I had only shot three strikes, and I have a one hundred percent misidentification rate. Yeah, here, here, here's here's some footage. Come on. logo is written both ways you can read it from the front or the rear they have the 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 frying pan with world central kitchen written upside down and then written in the other direction so if you're approaching from the rear or from the front of the vehicle from above you can read this both ways yeah. so, i'm sorry you're mis misidentifying i don't buy it i don't buy it I've, yeah, there's nothing. You have to be really, really willing to believe that Israel is never the aggressor here. Mm -hmm. right. This this is right up there with the government of China going, us? Steal foreign technology? Why, we would never do that. And for you to say so is interfering in our politics. <laughs> it's like girl we smell you <laughs> it's like we know you're this act this act is only working for people who have already bought the real estate here oh yeah just nobody else is believing the fact that it's like yeah, no we we would never do anything wrong yeah all right so uh that one is our lead story today because it's not necessarily something that's happened in Canada, but given that the, you know, um, Canada and the United States are, and now the UK are really starting to lose patience with uh, Israel. And uh, given that there is a dual Canadian American citizen who was uh, taken out by this mm -hmm. uh, attack, um, you know, it's one of those things where, uh, you know, the leaders of all the nations where they had nationals uh, of their countries die um, are going to be involved in this. And um, like I said, I don't know how much longer, how much rope the government of Israel is going to get because nothing in their position or their attitude has changed since day one. And their attitude is, um, we're going to wipe them out. Mm -hmm. We're going to do it the way that we want to do it. And if you get in the way, woe be to you. Yeah. And if you have anything to say about it, we don't fucking care. It's basically what it boils down to. Now, Nothing more. Now, some people might ask, is that an unreasonable position considering what happened on October 7th? Well. And considering the history of Hamas with Israel over decades and decades and decades and decades, and I can not, certainly understand somebody yeah. waking up one day and say, you know what? I am freaking sick and tired of this. I'm going to put an end to this once and for all. Completely understand how can someone can get that situation, can, can arrive to that. But uh, as we say in French, mon dieu, il y a bien une limite. It's, Lord, there's a, there's a freaking limit here. To what? But so that's what I mean. It's an impossible, it's an impossible discussion to have because you have Hamas that has a stated mission yes. to wipe Israel off the map. 
that's their mission. They've stated this publicly more than once. Over decades. Yeah. Right? And they've acted on it. From the mountains to the sea, right? They've acted on it. So, I yeah. mean, you know, I can understand the government saying, you know what, like this, we've tried to contain it. We've tried this. We've tried that. We've tried that. It's been 60, 70 years. You know, like, let's just freaking wipe them out. Let's be done with this already. Mm-hmm. Just, but we still have international obligations, and there still is this situation that Israel is an occupying force and that the borders are sealed and that you have a very densely populated area from which no one can escape. Yeah, it's the world's largest outdoor prison. Because Egypt is not helping open the border on the other side, and nobody wants to take the Palestinians in. And Palestinians don't have passports. Yeah. So, uh, you know, and this is the thing. I I think that we've hit the point now. I think we hit it long ago, but I think we've clearly Mm -hmm. hit the point now that uh, even if Israel did successfully manage to wipe out Hamas, they have just literally, with what they've done, created the next generation mm-hmm. of terrorists and yeah. vigilantes and martyrs and everything else, however they will call themselves. See, because um, this, this just adds fuel to the fire, right? Yeah. That's all this does. It just, all this just does is plant the seeds for the next thing like this in 15 years. And it's just going to continue to go on for a few more centuries. Yeah. So, um, you know. Hamas. So we destroy the planet and we all die. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, again, for all of us who are armchair generally, all us armchair generals, what is the right thing to do when an organization has said for decades that their objective is to wipe you off the map mm-hmm. and they've acted on it? And Look, when nobody's now, questioning whether Israel has the right to defend itself. Of course it does. That's not even up for debate. It's what is a measured response? Yeah. What is a measured response? And and, and again, you, like I said, you get to the question of what's a measured response if you consider October 7th as an event that happens in isolation, mm-hmm. disassociated from all the history they have. And what's a measured response if you're looking at October 7th? Like, okay. This is the last damn straw. So, and how do you rid yourselves of an organization like Hamas in a territory such as Gaza? So that is a prison with all the borders are sealed up. And like logistically, it's an impossible task. Hmm. Because there's always going to be people or a hospital or a school or a community center or a church or a mosque or something like somewhere where you are hitting. This, right? this is an interesting comment. You're wrong. Hamas reformed their charter. Is that true? I don't know this. Please correct us. If we've made a mistake, we're happy to accept that we have. Uh, I, I did not know this. If someone can provide us with uh, documentation to verify that, we're happy to uh, report it. If that is the case, I don't know. I don't know that that is the case. Hmm. I I don't know. Yep. It it could very well be. I don't, I don't know. Look, it's not an issue I know nearly enough about to, to say that I'm well versed in it. Okay. I'm reporting what I saw. What I saw was world central kitchen was targeted blatantly. That's what took place. Yep. That was, that is what took place. So that's the real politic on the ground, whatever anybody's feelings are about the occupation, mm-hmm. specifically, whatever feel- people's feelings are about um, how Hamas uh, deals with Israel. The real politic on the ground, one way or the other, is that you have a situation that's very geographically unique. Mm-hmm in which there's an occupying force that wants that says that wants to completely decimate and re- rid a geographical area of another force that has explicitly said it wants to eliminate when somebody says i want to take you out i want you to no longer exist what is reasonable vice versa 
if you've been living in an open-air prison for decades and decades and decades, and the prospect of peace or two-state solution has been dangled in front of you for decades and decades and decades, but nothing ever seems to materialize, um, how long do you live under that without cracking? So, uh, again, our starting principle is that the Palestinians are not Hamas, and Israeli citizens are not the Netanyahu government. Right. This is leadership in both these jurisdictions that are making decisions that are making neither of them look good. That's for sure. And there's a lot of collateral damage among the, among the citizens and among the innocents. And not even along among the citizens and the innocents alone now, but among people from the outside that are just wanting to help. So... It's an untenable situation. It's an unsustainable situation. It kind of has to end at some point in some way. And it seems that both factions involved in the core fight have basically uh, not moved from the position that uh, this ends when one of us is wiped out. Because right now it seems that Hamas and Israel have decided that in this particular war that the only solution that's going to result in this stopping is one of these two being wiped out. Mm. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. I, I just put a link to the uh, the updated uh, charter. It's 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 a Wikipedia, but it has the 2017 Hamas charter, which uh, was, <laughs> I, it's changed quite a bit. I haven't read it all through. I'll, I'll read it later. But uh, the 1988 Hamas charter had been widely criticized for its anti-Semitism. The 2017 document stated that Hamas fight was not with Jews as such because of the religion, but with the Zionist project. However, yeah. Hamas fell short of repudiating the original 1988 charter, saying it was a document of its time, and the new document represented Hamas' position for now. Views on the 2017 document varied, while some welcomed it as a sign of pragmatism and increased political maturity and a potential stop on the way to peace. Many others dismissed it as a merely cosmetic effort designed to make Hamas sound more palatable while changing nothing about Hamas' underlying aims and methods. So I guess you have to interpret it your own way. I haven't yep. read it yet, but thank you, um, Clarity. Was it Clarity? Who who gave me that link? It was Clickty. 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 Click thank you, yeah, Clickty. Click Clickty's on uh, watching on uh, Twitter or X, however you want to call it. Um, so folks in the chat won't see uh, his comments unless I post them or their comments. So um, yeah, thank you, Clickty. Uh, and if you want, you can join us at. Uh, I'll, put, uh, I'll put it here on the on the screen. If you want to join us on YouTube, you can join in the chat with everybody else there. It's entirely up to you. Uh, but yeah, youtube.com backslash at true north eager beaver media is where you can find our YouTube channel. And uh, there's a, a large contingent of the damn fam there that uh, watches live every morning. And they, uh, we have some pretty good chats, pretty lively chats. Um, just yeah. give me a second, sir. I need to do two things. I need to close the window because it's gotten really cold in yep. here and grab no a cup of coffee. I'll be right back. Yep, no worries. So, um, like I said, let's see lots of. Uh, uh, impassioned uh, chat here uh, and conversation in the chat. Glad to see that. Glad to see that it's respectful. Um, let's just, uh, I know that people have positions uh, and beliefs and thoughts, but let's just remember uh, one word quick uh, to say that uh, just one side is all right and one side is all wrong. Um, a lot of these things depend on where in history you decide to start counting. And it depends on whether or not you choose to look at incidents as isolated things that happen in a vacuum or put in the context of the overall global thing. Um, I'm pretty sure most reasonable people were horrified by what happened on October 7th. Uh, and I'm sure that people, a lot of people are horrified by what has transpired after. And, um, I think there's a lot of people who can see, again, depending on where they look, that uh, a lot of people have been on the wrong. And it hasn't just been on one side. 
when it comes to this. Um, Israel, however, the current government of Israel, I think it cannot be denied because all of its allies, its close traditional allies, are pretty much all in agreement here that when it comes to this particular intervention and response, because there have been skirmishes before between both sides, but this particular response, um, the international consensus appears to be that Israel has gone way too far and has taken way too many liberties. And I think a lot of reasonable people would agree with that. Um, the question is, again, on the other side. And that's why, uh, particularly for people who are particularly concerned and very much concerned with the Palestinians, um, the how much is too much. Exactly, PNC Bio. It's the outsized response that's really too much. Exactly. I agree. I guess, and what I'm saying is that the argument happening on the other side is when another country or another group says that they want to eliminate you and have taken actions such as October 7th, what is the right sized response? There's, <laughs> there's, there, there, there. There is no consensus, and all of us are sitting here at home as, you know, like I said, armchair generals with whatever our limited knowledge of the history and of all the intricacies that have built up over years and years and years and years and in these types of skirmishes and these opinions, and none of us are going to convince each other here. Uh, that's why we try to focus on the humanity of the situation. That's why when Mr. Grizzly says he saw the side of the innocents, um, that's about the, I don't even want to say safe uh, position you can take, but it's the only one. It's the only one. It's the only one because the leadership of both organizations have lost their sense of reason and their sense of proportionality at the moment. So it's, uh, you know, it's one of those things. And uh, again, I'm seeing a lot of comments here uh, going on. Please don't make assumptions on what people believe and what people are doing based on one comment in one conversation. Mm -hmm. Don't assume anything. Don't assume anything. When you assume, assume you make anything. an ass out of you and me. Yes. Ass, you, me. Yes. Everybody has their positions and what they would like to see happen, but you also have to look at the real politic on the ground. Mm -hmm. Because the real politic cannot be denied, no matter what uh, people want to say. And the real politic is that you have an occupying force that has obligations and they are not meeting them. And you have a situation that has lasted decades that doesn't seem to be anywhere near resolution. And at the moment, at the current moment of where things being inflamed, you have neither side, the decision makers on either side, not the innocents, willing to give an inch which means we're going to be stuck in this kind of loop for a long time. For a long time. And here in Canada, us attacking each other for not being pure enough about what we believe is going on down there is creating a situation where our brothers and sisters, both Arab and Jewish, mm -hmm are experiencing some things here at home in Canada that they should never be experiencing. The number one mistake we can all make here, regardless on what side we are of this issue, is to bring that tension and that animosity and that hate and that bile here to this country and start please, acting on it here. Please leave that out, please. If we start treating each other here the way that they're treating each other over there, we are lost. Yeah. So no matter what we believe over here, here in Canada, we need to keep it in check. 
because we see where this goes. We don't want that here. We don't want that here. There are avenues that we can pursue. Mm -hmm. There are points of pressure. We can pressure our governments to do things, take positions. But ultimately, nobody here in this chat and nobody here watching it from Canada is going to make either Hamas or Netanyahu or Benny Gantz nope. or the Israel chief of defense or the the people in the Israeli government and the Israeli cabinet who are even more right-wing than Netanyahu. None of us, none of anything that we have to say to each other, none of anything that you have to say to us as hosts, so oh, you're taking this side or you're doing this or you're siding with a president, is going to change the mind of the leaders of Hamas and the line of the minds of Netanyahu. They don't hear anything we say. So we need to be a little more open to each other. And none of us are right because people are doing terrible things. Let's just all the, sit down. The Hamas side is doing terrible things. The government of Israel is doing terrible things. And everybody in the middle loses. Everybody in the middle loses. Like this, at, at the point where things are now, saying, well, they've been occupying like this. They, they, this is only reasonable that this happens. Maybe so. Maybe so. If this was purely organic and came from the, uh, was an uprising from the people, you know what, we've had enough of this occupation, we're revolting, that would be one thing. But this is Hamas. This is an organization with a charter and a mission and this that's equally exploiting Palestinians. Yes. And on the Israel side, you have a government that is very much exploiting its past relationships with its allies. Mm -hmm. And some could even say exploiting the legacy of the Holocaust. Yeah. Some could um, say that. Some could say I, I've, that. I've, I've seen and I've heard the argument. I'm How not going to. But How long are you going to coast on this? I've heard people say, does this give you the permission to do whatever you want for the future? Well, and, and here's... People are asking. And, well, and it's a legit question. I'm not going to ask it, but I will say this. Uh, if that... Okay, so that happened. We all know that happened. It's documented, well documented, what took place. The Holocaust happened. Why are you doing the same thing to another group of people that was done to you? Well, that's the other group of questions that are being asked at the moment. Remember that so, whole never again? We really meant that. Yeah. So that's what I mean. This is so damn complicated. There is so much history. Mm -hmm. There are so much individual, your family did this to my family, like this, or, you know, this happened to our family 30 years ago, and I still need to avenge this. There's a lot of this type of talk involved in all of this that none of us here at home from our very limited positions and our very limited knowledge, we have our sense of morality of what's right and wrong. But as we say on this show all the time, remember, and Bo of the Fifth Column reminds us of this all the time, if you are talking at international affairs from a point of view of morality, all you are doing is guaranteeing yourself disappointment. Countries do not have friends, they have interests. Morality is merely something that is used. The appeal from Britain and Poland and Australia and Canada and the U.S. Thinking, oh my God, the morality. You're killing aid workers. Some of them are our citizens. Think about what you're doing. That is merely a tool. Let's see if we can get them to change their behavior through emotional manipulation or through whatever like this. But morality itself? You know, we should really do the moral thing. Never, ever, ever figures into the calculation when we're talking foreign affairs. Do we have an opportunity to gain more power or a better positional advantage, or do we not here? It's pretty much the only consideration every time. So if you're looking at this type of thing from a moral perspective, say, no, my God, why can't they just do the right thing? Like this. Listen, more power to you, and I love you. Listen, mm -hmm. But I guarantee you, what you're setting yourself up for is disappointment. 
morality does not live here. I hate to be the one to say it, but morality does not live here. Clearly. Clearly. Morality does not live here. So the whole effort of trying to be right over someone else, particularly here in Canada where the battle is not happening, it, it, it's, it's a waste of time. Completely. It's a literal waste of time. Don't what we should that. be doing is Don't making watch. sure that Jewish Canadians and Arab Canadians here in Canada are feeling safe regardless of what's going on there. Exactly. That we're not engaging in anti-Semitism here and that we're not engaging in Islamophobia here with our fellow citizens who we share space with and pressure our government to try and find a way to apply pressure on both Hamas and the government of Israel to pump their brakes. And that's literally all we can do. Mm -hmm. And we have to go into this eyes wide open, as Kit Vim says here, with the real possibility that we may never convince them mm -hmm. because we just don't have that power. We just don't rate. <laughs> All of us that are sitting here, we're thinking, think about the innocence. Right now, we have two parties that say, uh, you know what? People who care about the innocence, we're just not that into you right now. For all our positions and what we would like to see, none of us can make the government of Israel or the leadership of Hamas take the decision that we would like them to take. That's just the reality. And when we lose sight of that, when we start to think that we, behind our keyboards, that we have some power to get these two factions to curb themselves, or that, that, that if we just apply enough pressure on the government of Canada and the government of Canada applies enough pressure on Israel, that the government of Canada alone will be able to solve this, okay. either in favor of the Palestinians or in favor of the Jewish people, depending on which side of this... Um, This debacle that you stand, mm -hmm. that's not going to happen. It's just not going to happen. It's not going to happen. And your passions are maybe better, or maybe put to use on better causes like homelessness or feeding people here at home. Just. <sighs> I wish that there was no war. Myself, I wish this wasn't going on. I wish Hamas had not done what it had done on the 7th. I wish that Israel had not done what it had done before. I wish that, you know, when we had the Oslo discussions, that something positive would have come out of that. Would we be on a whole other path? But we're not. Where we are is where we are. Yep, that's it. We can't um, change it. Yeah, we just, we, we can't change that. We have to. We have to, do, you know, talk about that. You know, we just <sighs> it's sad. It's very sad. It's sad and it's not a good feeling to feel powerless. No, no, it isn't. Um definitely is not, but 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 <laughs> look, you gotta come to grips with the fact that we are powerless. <laughs> You really are. You know, you don't know what's going to happen from one day to the next. Just try and live your life as best you can. Do no harm and help anybody you can. Yep. This, we're not going to change anything. Yep. And see, I see a comment here, Shane K. Your hopeless rhetoric was why this is persistent for so long. No, my rhetoric is not hopeless. And my rhetoric alone, I'm sorry, Shane K., but I don't have that power. Mm -hmm. My rhetoric alone is not what has kept this persisting for so long. It's not. Th that, that's just a silly statement. Mm. That's just, sir, you don't agree with me, so I'm going to hold you responsible for what happened. It's like, I had no part in this, my friend. And for you to be on the chat saying that it's my rhetoric that is causing this and that my rhetoric is hopeless. My rhetoric isn't hopeless. My rhetoric is hopeful. But it's not going to change anything. 
but we have to be realists as well. We have two factions right now that are not at all interested in listening to each other, and we have been yelling and screaming as a world population since October 7th. We are now April 3rd. If all of our collective yelling and screaming up until now has not had the desired effect, I don't think it's going to do Maybe it. it's time for us to realize that maybe we don't have that power at the yeah. moment. Something may change in the dynamic. Somebody may make a strategic or tactical decision that is so egregious, such as this, what happened with Central World Kitchen. World, sorry, oh, I keep on getting that World wrong. Central World Central Kitchen. Kitchen uh, that happened that might be at a point of inflection. Mm-hmm. It gets people that do have power to do stuff to make different decisions that will influence things down the road. But right now, we pretty much are in a situation where we are sitting here and waiting for one side to make such an obvious, huge, glaring error that it creates an opportunity for people to swoop in. But right now, we're in a holding pattern. We're in a holding pattern. We have two parties. We have two parties that have decided that they are not going to stop until they wipe each other off, out, or eliminate each other completely. So, uh, this is a situation that we're going to be dealing with for a while. For a while after we're gone, it'll yep. still be ongoing. Long after we're gone, and there is a very, 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 very good chance, very good chance that a lot of Palestinians die of starvation before this over. And there is a very good chance even that the Netanyahu government gets ousted by its own people before this even has a chance of being resolved. What might end up actually doing this is the protests within Israel itself. We still have to wait for it to play out. I'm afraid it's pretty so. sad. <clears throat> it's pretty sad. Uh, what else do we have? Do we have more time, Mr. Grizzly? Yeah, we got a couple minutes, but I want to go over a couple of things real quick to begin with. Um, let's let's discuss the national food program that school children will now be able to eat healthy, nutritious breakfast when they get to school. Okay. I think this is important that this will help uh, alleviate poverty for children. This will help families uh, because they won't have to worry about trying to scrounge a couple of pennies together to get a meal for a child in the morning. This is a really good program. And what was it Brian Mulroney said about Justin Trudeau? It's his big ticket items he will be remembered for. Dental care, daycare, pharmacare, national school food, uh, food program, Rental rights, this is a new thing. This is, this is all good for the country. This is good for Canada. Mm-hmm. I completely agree. I have nothing to say in no. opposition to that. I fully support it. It is absolutely good for Canada. Well, and and uh, for people uh, like Pierre Polly have to come around and say, oh, it's just a federal food bureaucracy. I mean... Again, you cannot be sitting there on one day claiming 1.9 or 2 million people are going to the food banks after eight years of Justin Trudeau. Here's Justin Trudeau saying, hey, let's feed hungry children. No. Yeah, exactly. He hates kids. Simple as that. He hates anything that anybody does that doesn't make him look good. Yeah. Um, Yeah. And uh, I'm going to address Shane K one more time, and this will be the last time because I think that Shane K is trying to dominate the conversation from the chat, uh, which is a behavior that we do not like here on the show. By the way, Shane, you seem to be new here. So, um, but uh, blame, think about the world and how the world ended apartheid in South Africa. Um, Shane, uh, just so you know, the apartheid system in South Africa existed from 1948 to 1990. It was not essential. It didn't appear one day on October 7th, 1948, and was eliminated on April 3rd, 1949. And it went on for 42 years before. And again, it was an opening. 
things got Mandela came along. Yeah, and who started? And then he got put in jail. And then, you know, other nations started to see something, and there were more attention. And then Margaret Thatcher wanted to have a policy, and Reagan wanted to have a policy, and people had a problem with that, and there was an opening, and then some people came in. And it was but it required Joe Clark who started it. Joe it Clark who started it, but it required, as was mentioned by Elizabeth May in her, in her, in her uh, tribute to Brian Mulroney, it took Joe Clark and Brian Mulroney being willing to stand up to friends. Yes, because Thatcher wasn't going to do it, and neither was Reagan. They eventually folded. And who was the one country who continu- who did not get on the embargo bandwagon and continued to trade with them daily? One country. Do you know who that was? I do not know. Israel. Israel. Yeah. yeah. Do you not see the irony in that? Because um, subjugated people and Israel is trading with the subject. Or, mm. And now we have the irony that it's South Africa that is bringing Israel to court under the ICJ because South Africa says, we've done this. We know where this leads. Thank you very much. That's exactly why they're doing it. Yeah. So it's like, yes, uh, we've learned from South Africa apartheid that it's something we don't accept as a global community. Yes. But we did not not accept it as a global community in the very year that it happened. Mm Mm-hmm. And resolved it within the year is the point that I'm making. It took 42 years for that situation to be resolved. And the main crux of that effort didn't happen until the last two, three years before it popped over. Once we started having like bands and musicians, you know, boycotting Sun City and, yeah. and all that type of stuff. And, you know, it was a confluence of things that happened in the last few years. That led to that, but you know, pretty much from 1948 to 1982 or 83, before anybody knew really what the hell was going on, not much was going on there. You know that the the, the apartheid government didn't allow televisions in South Africa until the early 1980s, late 70s, early 80s. Television was against the law. I'm not. I'm not joking. I, that's a real thing. They did not have television in South Africa until I think 1979 or 80, something like that. Because they thought that, uh, well, the, it was a, an apartheid government was also a controlling dictatorial government. And it was how they controlled the population by putting out whatever message they wanted on radio stations that they controlled and newspapers that they controlled. And they thought television would be much like the internet, a free for all where information could actually flow freely, true or untrue. Yep. Now I see this the comment again. It's like, we need to do this one faster. We know what's going on with this one. Yes, we do. But we still have the same basic situation that we had in South Africa during apartheid. Two factions not willing to end it. Mm-hmm. Something has to happen over there such that it is in the interest of one of the parties to end it. And neither one wants to. South Africa wanted to join the international community. Mm -hmm. Really, really did. Really did. So it took the steps it needed to to take. Finally, after X number of years, after 42 years, and it didn't ultimately work for them, their apartheid project didn't have the result they had hoped for, Mm -hmm. and now was starting to cost them internationally, after four decades... That's why I'm saying these things can take a while. Well, if you're willing to write off all of your neighbors and all of your governing parties, and whatnot, because they weren't able to get it done on your schedule, mm-hmm. when these are things that sometimes take decades to resolve and you expect it to be done in a year, and just say, you know, well, we have to act faster. Again, these are morality based arguments. And they go nowhere. I'm sorry to have to break it to you. And I'm sorry to have to say it this way. And I know it sounds like I'm being hopeless, but I'm not being hopeless. I'm being a realist because once you deal with reality, then you're able to see the field of play and put yourselves in the right position for when that opening happens to be in the right spot or where the puck is going so that you can say the thing that needs to be said or take the action that needs to be said, taken. That might be the thing that finally tips the scale. Mm -hmm. But when you're in the moment of it, when both parties are fully inflamed and they are just not listening yeah. because they still think they can win this, nothing 
is going to happen. Nothing that we want to happen is going to happen. That's just reality. Well, and, and Vim was born in South Africa, so she has, uh, can tell you things that uh, none of us could ever understand. I have friends that were born in South Africa under apartheid who came to Canada once they were able to. Uh, did you know that uh, Steve Nash, NBA two-time MVP, uh, Steve Nash, Canadian, uh, born in South Africa, and his family emigrated to Canada because they didn't want their children raised under apartheid because they disagreed with it. And I guess they saved and got their stuff together and brought their family here and have never looked back. I've been to South Africa. It's a beautiful country, beautiful people, but I've only been there post-apartheid. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm, I'm, getting, I'm getting another silly question. What would you say if it was a couple of kids fighting? That is a silly question. It's a silly question because kids don't have a multi-million dollar budget and a nuclear arsenal. <laughs> I mean, let's, let, let's not oversimplify this to the ridiculous here. Yeah, I mean, we, can't, like, we, can't, we can't dumb it down because it's a, it's a complex issue that's been going on forever. Stop wanting to be right. Simple. Stop wanting to be right. I don't have a solution. The battle, the war is not being right, being the most moral. That's not the battle at the moment. From our perspective, the battle is, is there an opening such as this type of incident that just happened with Central World Kitchen? Mm -hmm. You got to sit and you got to wait for an opening. This thing happened. All the major countries are sitting there and go, oh my God, this is outrageous. We can't have this. There needs to be some consequences. Why not? Hoping that this movement and this outrage from collective international outrage will be enough to bend Israel's ear. But the question is, does Israel want its ear bent? If it does not and is not open to it, it does not matter. How much we yell, we scream, we say that this is deplorable, this is horrible, this is unacceptable, it should never happen again, Israel has responsibilities, you got to take them. Israel does not want to take its responsibilities and does not want to accept that what it did was wrong or over the line. It will ultimately come to nothing. You have to stop, to, you have to, have to, have to stop being invested in being right. And you have to be invested in doing what you can preferably locally, to make sure that we treat each other here in Canada with kindness and respect. And that's where the government is falling at the moment on this issue. So whatever positions they're taking internationally, where they, are where they are falling and where they are failing, is that domestically they are not saying enough about what it is that we are doing to each other here on our home soil as a result of what is going on over there. Mm -hmm. That is something our federal government has power to address. Yes. All right. Let's not bring the skirmish that's going on over there, over here, because we see where it went over there. And we don't want that here. We don't want that here. We need to stop fighting each other here in Canada. Let's all go to no the pub. No good's going to come from that. Let's all go to all the right? pub. All right. And, and for those of you who don't consume alcohol, you can have a non-alcoholic beer or a cup of coffee. Yep. And now remember, again, as we say on this chat, though, before we leave, no matter what we say on this chat, we hug it out. Mm -hmm. We hug it out before we go. All right. Just, but I'm very proud of you, Kits. Very proud of you kids because you guys have been absolutely wonderful during the chat and you're making some great points and you're making some great arguments. And even the people whose arguments that I'm speaking against, because I want you to know that I don't disagree with your passion. And I'm not saying that you're wrong for wanting what you want. This, my comments are more about expectations. Listen, I don't want you guys to be constantly disappointed and to create the cycle where you get a disappointment. And this fuels your anger and you get more angry and you get more venomous. And then 
it becomes this negative loop. Yeah, it doesn't help anybody. Like this. Want the good result. Want it. Fight for it. But keep your realis- your expectations realistic and just hold off on, you know, pulling the trigger of blame. Because these are very complex situations. This and you're dealing. You have to keep in mind, you can't lose the sight of the fact that you are dealing with parties here, not political parties, but parties, interesting you know, positions and stakeholders, the Israeli government and Hamas, yes, that are not interested at all in anything we have to say at this point in time in the skirmish. There will come a point in time where a grave mistake will be made, and that will provide an opening. But until such time, that time comes, we, we literally are screaming into wind tunnels. It's not productive. Nope. So let's, lose our, let's use our time and our voices to do things that actually are productive. That's why I'm saying focus on how we're treating each other here at home for now. That's all we can do. That's literally all we can do. But there will be an opening. There will be an opening. If you're talking about hopeful, that's the hopeful part. There will be an opening. Inevitably, there will be because someone always in these things makes a tactical mistake that is a major blunder at some point along the way. Well, I that think always just happens. did that too. That always happens. That's where you place your hope that somebody will do something monumentally stupid that will create an opening for something to find for the international community to do something that might actually work. That's where you put your hope right now. All right, kids and cubs. Yes, you can ask them. We should ask them to stop killing. Never stop. Ask that every single day. But just be prepared for the reality that they may not be listening. It falls on the, the old saying goes, which may be seen as offensive, but the old saying is it falls on deaf ears. Yeah. All right. Now everyone stand up if you can and let's twerk. <laughs> twerk it out. Twerk it out. Love it. Twerk it out. Twerk it out. Twerk it out. Uh, uh, uh. Shake your booty to the left. Shake your booty to the right. Uh, yes, Kid Jen, Douglas, check the mail. I did check the mail. I saw it. I will go and pick up your gift today. Thank you very much. And it comes just in time because our shows start up again today. So I'll be able to let you tomorrow know tomorrow how well it worked. So there you go. All right, Kiss and Cubs, that's the end of this episode of the Daily Beaver Morning Show. Uh, we hope that you enjoyed listening to us because we loved making this for you. Um, I am so sorry that we dealt pretty much with only just one subject. I had really intended uh, to do a lot more, uh, but uh, said there was a lot of discussion and a lot of, a lot of feelings about this on the chat, and I figured that what you had to say also mattered, so um, I decided to run with that. So thank you, kids, because you uh, helped program the show today. Good job. Well done. And uh, please, everybody's contribution today was really, really good. Even if I disagreed with you, the contribution was very, very good. You brought up some great points. Lucas, and we had a great discussion about it. So thank you very much. I very much appreciate your conversation, your contribution. You are always welcome here. Just because I didn't agree with you today does not mean you're not welcome and does not mean you're not cherished or valued. Right? I really do thank you for bringing in the other perspective. It was very, very needed today. So thank you so much. If you would like to help us, remember, sharing is caring. So please tell your peeps and poops all about us. Word of mouth is priceless. Then you are our best advertisers. If you would like to make sure that you do not miss an episode, you do not have to. Thanks to the Ray Girl. If you scan that QR code that is under my chin, that will bring you to our pod page. And if you're listening, that's podpage.com slash the true north eager beaver, lowercase letters with a hyphen between each one of those words. And that way, when we have something fresh off the bandwidth, we'll come directly to you. If you would like to help us out in other ways, you can go to the true north eager beaver media incorporated YouTube page. We love it when you do that, because when you do that, well, we've left three little buttons there for you, kids and cubs. They're called like, share, and subscribe. And if you click them or lick them, depending on what you 
Well, what tickles your fancy? Mm. <laughs> ah, then that makes us very, very happy. We are at, let's see, oh, 731 subscribers now. Wow, thank you so very much, Kids and Cubs. Please, 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 please keep on clicking that subscribe button. And whenever you share anything, that makes us very happy as well. If you'd like to help us in other ways, the QR code that's right by Mr. Grizzly's head brings you, brings you to our coffee page, and that is where you will find the Eager Beaver Lodge's Emergency Hydration Fund tip jar, where you can actually leave a couple of toonies or loonies if you have some spare change jingling in your pocket to help us produce, market, deliver the show to you. If you appreciate uh, our product, if you find value in what we do, please uh, stop over and leave us a little something. And if you're not able to, that's quite all right. Please don't worry because the gift of your attention is the thing that matters most to us. And when you do stuff like participate in the chat today, as Kit Ch uh, Sean has done and uh, Kit Ina has done, I believe I got it right today, and as everybody else has done, um, well, that makes it so that we have a much better product for you. So we appreciate that very much. Your participation matters, your retreats, your, your let's try that again, your retweets, <laughs> and all the other stuff, uh, comments, all of that helps promote the show. If you'd like to write to us, we'd like to hear from you, truenorthegerbeaver at gmail.com. And uh, if you happen to be listening on Apple Podcasts, leave us some stars and reviews. That helps us up very much. If you're listening to us on Google Podcasts, that service is going to be closing, I think, around the end of the month. So please find another podcast player to migrate to so that you do not miss us uh, because uh, we love to have your company. Uh, because democracy is something that you do, please rate your MPs, your MLAs, your MPPs, your senators, all that good stuff. Let them know on this particular issue how you feel. Uh, let them know that uh, uh, regardless of how you feel on this issue, that you would like, to take, uh, like them to take more measures to make sure that uh, Arab Canadians, Muslim Canadians, and Jewish Canadians are better protected at home. We need to be nice. we need to be good to each other here. So please uh, ask for some action on that movement. Make sure that we're all being good to each other here, while stuff that's not so good is happening over there. From the Beaver Lodge, this is your eager Beaver saying, "It could be a tough world out there, so please be kind to and gentle with yourself." Mister Grizzly, do you have some words of wisdom, please? Yeah, I need everybody to just chillax. Relax, take it easy. Life is difficult. Let's not make it difficult for one another. Embrace the kindness and share. Please. Tomorrow at uh, 7 p.m., just to let you know, Mademoiselle Fox's uh, fun and feminist conversations, her uh, show will officially debut at 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, 1900 hours for those of you who use that time frame. And uh, I will be producing it. I will not be appearing on it. It is Mademoiselle Fox and guests. So I know that uh, Mr. Beaver will be joining her at a show in the future, just this week's out of the question because he's going to be on stage, right? So I got to be a star, darling. He's going to be a star first. So, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Five more shows to shine. Five more shows to Sign. And unfortunately, right. we, we can't make it down to K Town to see them, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. And they are sold out. Hey, Poop. Life, life, you know. So, yeah, the link to uh, the link to her channel is there for those of you who want to join Mademoiselle Fox uh, for 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time tomorrow, April 4th, Thursday evening. Fun and feminist conversations. Wonderful. I still say poop. Then I can't be there. <laughs> and i will be I, i'm i'm just too much in demand darlings mm. <laughs> mr grizzly roll them credits please you are listening to a true north eager beaver media incorporated podcast the true north eager beaver podcasts are proudly brought to you by our founding sponsors the Misfy Mysteries from Corvid Moon Publishing, your source for science fiction, fantasy, and cozy mysteries featuring a broad diversity of characters. CanadianTarot.com, their uniquely Canadian online eclectic tarot community, and The Pepper Master. Hot pepper sauce is made from farm fresh ingredients to thrill your taste buds and expand your mind. We are grateful to the Cryer Media Network for its support, Pete Jarvis for our artwork, and Paul Joseph something for our opening and closing sequence music.
got something for you here. All uh, right. In memoriam, this is uh, from our friend Tom Green. I say our friend Tom Green because I've, I've known Tom for a long time. We're not close personal friends, but I saw him a couple of weeks ago at the pub. Uh, so he, he wrote this about his friend Joe Flaherty. So sorry to hear about the loss of comedy legend Joe Flaherty today. One of my true heroes from SCTV. Growing up watching him made me think about comedy in a completely different way. I was so lucky to get to work with him and spend time with him. In fact, he was our first celebrity guest on the Tom Green Show. And I was so excited to interview him. Before we were on MTV, this clip from a pilot we shot for the CBC in Ottawa, Canada in the late 1990s. Joe was one of the greatest of all time. My condolences to his friends and family and to all of his fans around the world. Rest in peace, Joe. And you see pictures of him on the set here. And and, uh, a warm embrace. So for the late Joe Flaherty and all of his fans, um, we hope you find some peace with his passing. Yep. Uh, he passed away at uh, 82 years old after a brief illness. Um, a lot of people assume that Joe Flaherty was Canadian because he, he made his mark on SCTV, but he's actually American born and uh, came to Toronto when the SCTV franchise was basically established there. Um, but um, really loved Canada mm-hmm. pretty yeah. much. And, uh, you know, uh, decided to make this his home. Um, SCTV was his big thing, but uh, you may have seen him as well in uh, Anchorman, The Legend of Ron Burgundy, uh, Frasier, Freaks and Geeks, Family Guy. Um, and uh, he's probably... Happy uh, Gilmore. Yes, well known for uh, his role in Happy Gilmore as the heckler, <laughs> which created... Le- yes, which led to like... I think that was the good, led to the great scene with Bob Barker, right? Yes. Eventually, yeah. which was absolutely fantastic. Um but yeah, he's a, uh, you know, if there, if ever we have an honorary Canadian, it's a uh, Joe Flaherty. Mm. So there we go. He thought it was cool that everybody well, thought he was Canadian. Well, and <laughs> by the way, so. there's probably a, a, a piece of Joe somewhere that, that is getting a big kick out of the fact that he died on April Fool's Day. Yeah, indeed. Indeed. So, and if you watched SCTV, Count Floyd, Guy Caballero, the fictitious owner of SCTV. Would you like some uh, more pancakes? <laughs> yes. <laughs> oh, that was not scary at all. Let's see if we can roll the film a bit. Would you like some more syrup? <laughs> <laughs> so, yes. Thank you so much. And of course, Floyd Robertson. <laughs> Floyd, Floyd, uh, what you Floyd Patterson was that the name? Was it Pat Patterson? No, Floyd Robertson. Robertson. It was yeah. Robertson. Okay. Yeah, yeah, Floyd Robertson. Yes, which was take on Lloyd course, Robertson. So yes. Floyd Robertson, famous uh, anchor. So yes, uh, rest in peace and uh, thank you for the laughs. Thanks for the laugh, Joe. Gotta go. I will see you. Bye, everyone.